Now let's look at the blood, which is a specialized fluid connective tissue that consists of formed elements and the matrix. And the matrix, as you recall, is the ground substance and all the proteins that make up the backdrop of connective tissues. So this is the stuff that cells sit in. In fluid connective tissues like blood, it's a very watery substance. And we have a special name for it when we talk about blood, we call it plasma. So plasma is the matrix of blood and it has dissolved within it proteins that are called plasma proteins. And these are globular proteins that are soluble. And there are many different types that we can look at a little bit later on, one of which we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about white blood cells. But the plasma is all of the space, the white space, if you look at a microscope slide of blood, that surrounds the cells. And you can't see the dissolved plasma proteins, but there are plasma proteins in there. Then we have the formed elements. And the formed elements consist of red blood cells, which we call erythrocytes. So we have red blood cells called erythrocytes. And we have white blood cells. And these are called leukocytes. So we have these types of blood cells, which are specialized for the transport of oxygen. And these have a very specialized shape we will notice they have no nucleus. This is very important. They have no nucleus. They have this what we call biconcave shape. And this biconcave shape means they're curved inward at the middle. So if you look at them in cross section, they look like these little dumbbells. And if you look at, at them top down, they almost look like little donuts, except they're not entirely hollow in the center. They're just very, very thin in the center. And this increases the surface area. Because what their job is, is to carry oxygen around to the tissues that need it. And so the more surface area, the more oxygen it can carry and release immediately to these tissues. So that is the function of red blood cells. And they become so specialized for this that they lose all of their, or most all of their cellular organelles. So they have no nucleus. And this is a very important distinction. Erythrocytes have no nucleus. Leukocytes, on the other hand, are white blood cells. And these are the things that are going to be fighting infection. So we'll look at these in a lot more detail when we get into the immune system, but they do have a nucleus. And I've drawn two of the most common types that we see. We have neutrophils and lymphocytes. And we actually have five total, but I just drew the two most common here. And they both have cell nuclei. So if you look at neutrophils, it has this kind of globular nucleus that has multiple lobes to it. And we call this polymorphonuclear because it has many lobes and it has this, this shape that has many parts to it. And so the neutrophils, as well as a few of the other white blood cells or leukocytes that we're going to look at, are going to have this oddly shaped nucleus. The lymphocytes are the second most common type of white blood cell we'll see in circulation is one of the smallest of the blood cells, but it has a giant nucleus that takes up most of the cytoplasm here. So it looks like this big eye looking at you. So these are the white blood cells for fighting infection. And then the last of our formed elements are platelets. And platelets are not actually cells, at least not in humans. These things are shed off of giant cells called megakaryocytes that will make these little platelets and the platelets go into circulation, and all they are are little packets of cytoplasm wrapped up in membrane. And they have a very special function, and that is in blood clotting. So they're usually just floating around in blood plasma and not doing anything until there is a reason to have some kind of clotting event, like somebody has a cut or there's a tear in a blood vessel wall and so forth. So these are our formed elements. The formed elements are floating around in plasma, and the plasma has proteins. They're called albumins, they're globulins, they're different types of plasma proteins floating around. And these are just soluble globular proteins that are dissolved within the plasma. The formed elements are not really dissolved. They're really more of a suspension. And if you put blood in a centrifuge and spin it down, you'll see that you can get the formed elements to come out of, of the suspension. 
and you will find that you get the red blood cells constitute the largest part and they will settle down to the very bottom of your tube and then if you look at the white blood cells which make up a much much smaller percentage of cells they form what's called a buffy coat between the red blood cells and the plasma. And then the plasma, which is just a fluid with dissolved proteins in it, sits on top. Now let's look at the specific types of white blood cells. And we have a very interesting acronym that can help us remember this, and that is never let monkeys eat bananas. And it not only will give us sort of the names of each of the types of the white blood cells, but it also tells us the prevalence with which we find them in circulation. So the most common type is neutrophils. So the neutrophil is the most abundant type of white blood cell or leukocyte in circulation. And your book puts the numbers around between 54 and 62%. So the holes anatomy basically will put this percentage about here. Now these percentages do vary from one text to the other or from one source to another, but this is a fairly good representation. And we find that if you are looking for infection or signs of infection and you're doing white blood cells and counts, you would expect there to be somewhere between 55, 54, and 62 percent of your count which consists of these neutrophils. And neutrophils are the first white blood cell to the site of infection. They're going to be the first responders, so to speak, and they're going to start the immune response immediately. And these guys are polymorphonuclear. That means they have that multi-lobe nucleus. They also have little granules inside that will stain sort of a light color here, but you can sometimes see them. And these guys are going to be fairly recognizable by the fact that they have sort of a pale stain with a dark nucleus and the nucleus has these multiple lobes to it. The next cell that we're going to talk about is called a lymphocyte and that's the big eye with the, the large nucleus looks like a big eye looking at you and these actually have three types that we're going to get into in a lot more detail when we get to the lymphatic system and immunity. But the lymphocytes have what we call T cells, which are responsible for cell mediated immunity. So these will be very specific to pathogens that the body encounters and they will destroy those pathogens cell to cell. We've got B cells, and these are the ones that will ultimately be responsible for producing antibodies. And these are these proteins called immunoglobulins that float around attaching to pathogens and destroying them as well. So the B cells produce antibodies. Think of B as an antibody. Or, and these are the ones that are going to be producing these proteins that will then become part of the blood plasma. And if they encounter what we call an antigen, this is something that they are specific to and recognize, then they will also be part of mounting an immune response to it. Then we have natural killer cells, NK cells, and these are sort of like your surveillance and sentinel cells of the lymphocytes, and they are going to look for abnormal cells, cancers and infected cells and the like. And they will not be specific, they're not specific at all like T and B cells are. These are specific to very particular antigens, and they only will respond to certain types of pathogens, whereas natural killer cells will respond to just about anything that's abnormal. All right, below that, we have our monocytes. And monocytes have this large kidney bean shaped nucleus, and these also tend to stain a very pale color, and the kidney bean shaped nucleus is darker, and this is what's going to migrate out of the blood circulation fairly quickly and migrate through the, the endothelial layer of the vasculature. So in other words, it's going to migrate out of the circulatory system, and out of blood and into tissues. And so these are very large cells and they have this large nucleus. These are larger than the other cells. And when you put them on a microscope and then flatten them with a slide, they tend to get flatter still. But the monocytes will migrate out of tissues and they're very large. So you can think of them as monsters, monster cells that migrate out of, out of blood into tissues, and they become macrophages. 
So these are going to become your macrophages. So the monocytes are the monsters that migrate into tissues and become macrophages. So it's pretty easy to remember those. And these account for about three to 9% of your circulating white blood cells. Now keep in mind that these things don't stay in circulation long once they enter the, the blood because what they're going to do is they're going to leave fairly quickly and enter the tissues and become macrophages. So they mature into macrophages. So in their mature form, they are macrophages. Finally, we got our last two types here, our eosinophils. And these also have our polymorphonuclear shape to them, their nucleus and the nucleus stains dark, but these like certain types of acid dyes or acid stains, like eosin. And so phil means to like, so eosinophils like this dye, and so that makes them this kind of bright red color. So they have a really, depending on what kind of stains are actually used in the preparation, when you look at a microscope slide, a smear of blood, they turn out, the cytoplasm is full of these little granules, and they turn out to be this really nice red or orange color with this dark nucleus in the, in the background. And these are very good at fighting infections like flukes and parasites, these kinds of infections. And they also help mediate the inflammatory response. So when they come to a site of infection or injury, they will be part of the system that really kind of ramps down in the inflammatory response. The other cell that we have here is a basophil, and this actually incites an inflammatory response. So this will come into an area where there might be an injury or inflammation, or, or sorry, an injury or damage, and it will cause an inflammation temporarily to wall off that area. And this basophil here releases heparin, heparin, which is an anticoagulant. I don't know if heparin has an E on it or not. Heparin, which is an anticoagulant. And so it's going to prevent blood clotting. That's going to allow more blood to come in. That's going to allow the ingress of more of these white blood cells. So heparin and histamine. And histamine is an inflammatory agent. And so that helps temporarily wall off the area. And it's kind of like putting up a barrier around you know, an area of, of either a natural disaster or a crime scene or whatever. It keeps the problem from spreading and it also prevents, you know, it also helps wall off the area so that the attack can be mounted within that area. So let me write this. These are eosinophils up here and these are our basophils. Now we have several other ways to classify cells. So these are typical, the five types of white blood cells that we see. We will see that three of them end in fill. Not only is that a guy's name, in this case, it just means philic or liking something. So in this case, they like particular stains, but why they are called fills is because they have these little granules in them that tend to pick up those particular stains. So these are called granulocytes, and they're called granulocytes because you can easily see the granules that are inside. And these granules are little, like vesicles that contain things like enzymes and cytotoxic chemicals. In this case, it's heparin and histamine. And these basically are containing the things with which these cells are going to be fighting the pathogens. So each one of them, you can think of as filled with granules. So neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils are all filled with granules, as you can see. And they also, if you rearrange them a little bit, they spell Ben. So our granulocytes spell Ben. The other two, our lymphocytes and monocytes, are what are called agranulocytes. Because while they do have granules inside, they don't really stain very well, so it's hard to see them. So you're not gonna see the granules inside the monocytes and the lymphocytes, so these are called agranulocytes. Now there's another thing that we can think about here as to the function of these cells. We already know that lymphocytes have very specific, what we call specific immunity. The other cells are not so particular. They'll go after any pathogen. But we have certain cells that will phagot phagocytize the pathogens, most obvious of which is the neutrophils. So we've got neutrophils, 
But the monocytes are our big phagocytes, our macrophages, which macro means big, phage, eat. So our big eaters are our monocytes. So these are another of our phagocytes. In fact, these are the biggest of our phagocytes. So we've got the monocytes, we've got the neutrophils, and we've got the eosinophils. These are also macrophages, or, or these aren't macrophages, these are microphages actually, because they're also eaters. They eat pathogens and debris. In this case, they're eating pathogens. Both of these two are what we call microphages because they eat, but they don't eat as much as our big eaters here, our monocytes. But these are all these three types here, our monocytes, our neutrophils, and our eosinophils are what we call phagocytic cells. And if we rearrange them a little bit in terms of their, they spell men. So I wouldn't say that men are big eaters necessarily, but eh, some of them are, some of them aren't. But at any rate, these are our eaters. So we've got our macrophage, which is our big eaters, and our two microphages here are neutrophil and eosinophils, which are small eaters. And these, all three of these will literally devour a pathogen by engulfing it.